Well, let's get to the questions. Abby, you're up first. Hi, my name's Abby. Um, I'm a sophomore at Glenbard West. And um, my question is, um, why is it so difficult for teens to have self-compassion? Okay, it's a good question. And by the way, it's, it's difficult and, and stay on until so Copla can ask you a question as well. So it's, it's difficult for everyone. So the vast majority of people are kinder to others than themselves. But it's, it's especially hard for teenagers, partly it's because, um, you know, you haven't, you haven't had the life experience to realize that what you're going through is normal, right? It really does feel like the first time you fall in love or the first time you get your heart broken or the first time you fail, it really feels like it's just me. One of the gifts that does come with age is you start realizing that actually this happens to most people, but it's a little harder when you're a teenager just because everything's so new. Um, but part of what happens is, um, when you fail or you make a mistake or you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, you tend to feel threatened, don't you? Like, oh my God, there's some, some danger. Now, when your friend looks in the mirror and doesn't like what she sees or something happens, you aren't so personally threatened. So when it happens to you, when, when difficulty happens to us, we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. It's like we fight ourselves or we flee, like we hang our heads in shame or we freeze and we get stuck. We, basically we get kind of more freaked out. <laughs> and when we're freaked out, it's harder to be self-compassionate. When your friend is having trouble, because we're, we're calmer about it, it's not happening to us, we are more able to tap into um, what's called the, the tendon befriend response. That's also natural to help others, but it's a little easier to access that. So we're kind of doing a little hack. <laughs> we're using the care response, which may be evolved to help others and we're using it for ourselves. Does that make sense? So in other words, don't beat yourself up for beating yourself up or don't say like, what's wrong with teenagers today? It's really natural to do this. It's just not very helpful. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Great. You're welcome. Shannon, you are up next. I know you talk a lot about friends and I was just wondering how can I help my friends if they're um, being like always so hard on themselves? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. You, you, you can't, I've learned this the hard way. <laughs> you can't shove it down anyone's throat, right? So if people are resistant to self-compassion and you really, and they feel like they're being forced, they're just gonna resist it even more. The best way to help your friends be more self-compassionate is to model it, right? So in other words, like out loud, if you can, be self-compassionate. Again, if you, something happens, just you, you often talk out uh, loud in front of your friends, or maybe if you're more shy, just try, try speaking out loud in front of your friends or talking about the fact that you're only human being, you're trying the best you can, you know, it's okay to fail, everyone's imperfect. If you embody self-compassion, then they'll experience to you. And again, we've got research showing that if you hear someone being self-compassionate, you are more likely to be self-compassionate. So that's probably the best way to do it. Um, but you can also talk about it. I mean, you can even say something like, like, well, if you said that to me, do you think it'd be very helpful to me? And they're probably, no, I would never say that to you. And it's like, well, what do you think it's doing to yourself when you say that to yourself? That's the thing about self-compassion. It's kind of common sense. It really isn't rocket science. The, the biggest thing is um, people are afraid that means they're gonna uh, not have motivation. Right? And so again, you can think about like a coach. I don't know if you do sports or if you're in drama or anything like that. Think about a, a coach that's really helpful. If they're really, if they yell at you and scream at you, you may kind of work a little harder, but the best coaches are the ones that's like, I got your back, I believe in you, but here's how to help, here's how to improve. Very constructive, hands-on encouragement. And that's the, that's the most effective thing for ourselves as well. So yeah, getting over that barrier. Motivation is just, it's a huge barrier to self-compassion, but it's, anyway, thanks. <laughs> So your, your important book, Self-Compassion, The Proven Power, Being Kind to Yourself, yes. The Fierce Self-Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness to Speak Up, Claim Their Power, and Thrive. Was there a, a reason why you focused on women? Yes, yes. I did. And, I, and I, So everyone needs both fierce and tender self-compassion, but the blocks are different. So think about gender role socialization. 
boys, they're allowed to be fierce, but they aren't allowed to be tender. They get called names if they're too soft or tender. Girls aren't allowed to be fierce, right? They get called different names if they get angry or something, right? And so you might say the blocks to the balance of fierce and tender self-compassion are different for people socialized as boys or girls. And so it's, everyone needs it, but it was just, it was too complicated to write the book from both points of view. So I wrote it for a woman, also partly as a response to the Me Too movement, because I really see the Me Too movement as fierce self-compassion in women, women rising up and saying, you know, we aren't going to take this anymore, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And the, the power of Me Too, like the common humanity, we're standing in this together. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the book's aimed at women. But I've had a lot of uh, my male friends read it and say it was equally helpful for them. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I need someone else to write the book about the harm done to men. And it really is harm. The fact, you know, boys, if they can't access the healing power, the tender side of self-compassion, that's a really powerful tool that they don't have access to. So it harms everyone that's this inability to balance, but the book focuses more on women for that, for those reasons. Okay, very good, thank you. We're gonna to go to the Q and A. What's the difference between self-compassion and self-care? Right, so self-care, you know, it kind of depends how you use the term. Typically it's talking about self-care behaviors, like eating right, getting rest, getting a massage, doing yoga. So self-compassionate people are more likely to engage in self-care, but they aren't exactly the same thing. So for instance, um, we, we taught self-compassion to healthcare workers, healthcare providers, totally burned out, stressed out healthcare providers. They don't have time to meditate. They don't have time to do yoga. They barely have time to eat. So although um, it's important to do self-care, self-compassion is, is more broad and it's really about how you relate to yourself emotionally. So even if you don't have time to act, engage in those behaviors, it's great if you can, but if you don't, self-compassion is more about like, I'm feeling confused. I'm feeling totally overwhelmed. I'm hurting. I'm feeling grief, whatever it is you're feeling and emotionally being warm and caring and supportive towards yourself. So you might say self-compassion includes both behaviors and emotional support. Um, self-care is, is more focused on the behavior. So, but self-care doesn't really help you on the job. It only helps you off the job, like before you get to work. Self-compassion is something you can do in every moment on the job as you're going through the difficulty. So that, that's the biggest difference. Very good. But both are great. They're all good. <laughs> uh, next question. Can you talk about strategies for parents to help cultivate self-compassion in our children, especially young women? Yes. Uh, well, so like I, I say, modeling really is the most effective way. So embodying it, so people have that sense of compassion from you and modeling it out loud. Uh, but there are also programs now. So um, the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion is a nonprofit I started, and we, we teach self-compassion um, training courses online. And there are programs for um, teens, and there's one currently being developed for parents and their kids and for little kids. So you can, there's also books out there that you can read. So um, the, the basic thing is the language just needs to be a little different. So the word compassion even is kind of abstract for a child, but being a good friend to yourself. So when you teach, so there's some good books on my website, selfcompassion.org that, that use like, when you teach a kid about friendship, how to be a good friend to others, make sure you include the idea of also being a good friend to yourself. You can actually talk about it, friendship, support. And remember, a good friend doesn't let you like get away with things that are harmful. That's not being a good friend. A good friend says, hey, you need to do something differently, but not because you're bad, but just because I care about you. And so those kind of dialogues and discussion, um, again, separating the value of the person from the behavior uh, are seem to work pretty well with kids. They, they get it. Kids are naturally kind, believe it or not. That's what the research shows. We were evolutionarily, we want to help. Helping behaviors start almost automatically at about age two and a half. But the behaviors evolved to help others. So what we, what we need a little help with is, help with helping, <laughs> is returning that instinct around to also include ourselves. And that can be done just through modeling, discussion, um, or even training if you're so inclined. 
Um, two more questions. You have a lot of people who came here because they uh, are connected to Kasten and Tracy Heiler's uh, get, got the word out. So I want to acknowledge and thank her for that. So here's our next question. Okay. Uh, the self-compassion break practice um, yes. is a good one to teach. Um, so um, they can learn this skill. How young of an age would you recommend inducing, introducing this kind of a practice? And maybe you want to make mention of what that is. Well, so the self-compassion break is a practice um, I just taught, which is basically calling the three components of self-compassion. And by the way, I left out one piece of it just because of time, but um, it also helps use physical touch um, mm. as an indicator of care. I, the reason I didn't do it is because it's kind of touchy-feely, unless you explain the science, people think it's touchy-feely. But like putting your hands on your heart or cradling your face or giving yourself a little hug, you can often use that along with the self-compassion break. And those type of embodied practices are especially effective for young kids, right? Just, just like putting their hands on their heart or giving themselves some sort of physical touch. Um, so, uh, you know, I personally have not taught self-compassion to young kids. I know some of my colleagues have worked on adapting these, these, um, exercises for kids. Like I've taught it to my son, but that's slightly a little bit different, but so, so in other words, I just want to say, I haven't done it myself, but from what I understand, um, using just really simple language, things like, um, being fr words like friendly. I'm not using really abstract words, physical touch, um, movement. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, a little kid would go crazy in our adult course because we do, like, do a lot of sitting and going inward and you can't do that with the kid. But using movement and, um, and touch and uh, th those types of things seem to help. Mm -hmm. But again, there are, there are a few books on my website. If you go to my website, selfcompassion.org and you look on resources, there are a few books in there for kids and hopefully more will come out soon. I loved when you did this. It just took me just like, that's what a simple, simple just reminder if you- Yeah, well, but it works at the level of physiology. We actually have research that shows it reduces cortisol, increases heart rate variability. It works with the nervous system because touch evolved to be the primary signal of care for humans. Think about it, that's how we communicate care to babies. And so when we touch ourselves in a kind way, it, it does feel a little funny, I'm not gonna lie, but it actually changes our physiology. And so sometimes it's easiest to start with touch and then use the language after you've calmed down a little bit. Right. Your body doesn't seem to really know the difference between a compassionate touch from another and self-compassionate touch. It responds in a similar way to both, which is good news. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a tough one. When, when you really have a real crisis, um, yes. and what then? Yeah, so um, like I say, so compassion is not like magic dust. It's not going to make your problems go away, but it it's a really, really powerful coping me mechanism, especially compared to its opposite, which is shame and self-criticism, mm -hmm. right? So um, for people, let's say, with trauma histories, I, I do have to maybe mention this, for people who've experienced a lot of trauma, maybe early family trauma or just a lot of trauma in their lives, sometimes just to get through life, we've had to shut down our heart just to survive. We've had to close down. And what can happen when we first start to practice self-compassion, especially if our habitual way of coping is to shut down, is we call it backdraft, right? It's like, like when you fling open the doors of a house on fire, the air rushes in, the flames rush out. Sometimes it can happen with ourselves that way also. So like, you know, we open our hearts and all the pain floods out and we think we're doing it wrong. Well, in fact, we're actually doing it right. It means we're getting access to that pain, but it also means we need to go slowly. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a long way of saying for people in a real crisis situation, especially if there's um, other stuff going on, maybe in your family history, or, or if just your coping mechanism has been to shut down, it can be really helpful to go through this journey with a therapist. In fact, what we're finding is what good therapy is largely is helping people to be more self-compassionate, right? But, but so therapists working through these issues and some of the fears of self-compassion, am I worthy of self-compassion? Am I going to be able to handle it? Uh, it can also help to have the guidance and compassion of a therapist along the way. 
Okay. Last question. Just, one step at a time. Just go back one one moment at a time. Good. Yeah. Um, are there differences across cultural groups in how self compassion is practiced or experienced? Uh, yes, it seems to. One, one surprising thing is like these myths about self compassion that it's selfish, that it's going to make you lazy. That surprisingly seems to hold in every culture I've had contact with. They all have the same fears of self compassion. So there's something about that that seems to be pretty universal. Um, what we find is that the levels of self compassion differ. So in places like Thailand, for instance, and in Thailand, like Buddhism is really part of the culture and it's kind of a very gentle culture, people are more self-compassionate. Um, it's not just East-West though, places like Taiwan where it's like achievements really emphasized or places like uh, the UK actually also where kind of stiff upper lip is emphasized. It tends to be lower levels of self-compassion. So you might say compassion, uh, the culture can kind of help facilitate or inhibit how much compassion people have. But what we know is that in every single culture we've looked at, people do better who have more as opposed to less self-compassion. So it's kind of a, a universal good, but some cultures make it a little more tricky than others to access it. <laughs> yeah. There are so many emails coming to me thanking you for this uh, honor of your time tonight. You brought so much perspective, balance, and joy into my life. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 there are a lot of, there are some specifics people have asked me. I'm in, in, encouraging people to email me at gilda underscore Ross at glenbard.org. And I will answer those questions for you. Um, I'm really happy that I can say tomorrow, we're, we're going to continue a lot of this conversation with Toby Struggs when we talk about self-care and mindfulness. So we're going to have a two day um, immersion in this important, important way of, of treating ourselves. I can't thank you enough. What an honor to be with you tonight. Thank well, you. Thank you. It's been, a, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. We value your work. Thank Stay you. safe, everybody. Come okay. back have tomorrow. Good evening. All right. Bye-bye. So Take care. Have a good night, everyone.